It's a very special day. Um, uh, we waited for this talk for a long time. Um, so this is Je Jeff Kapek. It would not be an overstatement at all to say that I learned everything that I know about industrial design from Jeff Kapek, uh, for sure. Um, who has informed like so many parts of my life and so many parts of this um, this department um, in many many ways. Uh, well. I've talked about Jeff a lot, so you all know that Jeff is the person that I convinced to hire me um, after school. Um, and uh, I was a little bit crafty about that because um, I had convinced Jeff and his partner, Kazuna Tanaka, to be my off-campus thesis advisors. Uh, this was in 1987. Um, and so put myself in that orbit and then essentially forced them to hire me um, after, after the thesis. <laughs> And uh, apparently I'm busted, so someone's calling. You can. No, no, no. Um, but I like the ringtone, so it's good. <laughs> so when my yeah, so I was a little bit crafty about it, and that's one of the reasons why I recommend um, to you to be building your network and to not be making cold calls and sending out you know, resumes to um, ads, well, in those days, in newspapers. Um, and to really start early. Um, it was also one of the things that we passed along as well, that one of the ways that you can use your thesis is just try and set up the next part of your life um, and to find people who are aligned and people who will um, mentor you. And so Jeff was my, my mentor. Um, and there are a few other things uh, that I think you need to know. Um, probably like one of the most talented um, industrial designers I have ever, I have ever seen. Um, probably the hardest working person I've ever seen, I would say. Sorry if I'm, you know, gushing, but it's absolutely true. Um, a very early entrepreneur in terms of boutique uh, design agencies, really at a time when a lot of people were trying to hang out a shingle and it was hard and then sort of medium and larger companies, there was a lot of consolidation. Um, and just like in terms of uh, independent design publishing, independent design consulting is, you know, is challenging. Um, and Tanaka Kapik Design Group has been at it for how many years? 35. 35 years, so that's quite a legacy. Um, recently, I have to show you this. So this is Catherine McElroy's um, book, actually, I guess one of the first books to come out of this department. Um, and uh, I was um, lucky to be asked to write the foreword. Um, and in the foreword, I tell a story about when I was working at Jeff's um, design firm around the design of the toothbrush, the Oral-B toothbrush, which is, I think, a uh, story that many of you have heard, where instead of designing renderings and spinning them on a, on a computer monitor, we made prototypes, um, 112 prototypes, to my recollection, um, and brushed with them all um, in the shop. And when the client came in, um, they, uh, they were sort of confronted with a line of these toothbrushes, remember? And then every, I think, 30 toothbrushes, there was like a dunking sanitization, you know, station. Yes. And so the notion was that they would actually come in and brush their teeth, which I think they sort of barely did. Um, <laughs> but I think that they had, um, they had been working, they had been trying out like a phase one, a few, few different design firms. And, and this was the design firm that actually um, went into the shop and made things and didn't talk. Um, and didn't render, but actually built things, um, and then got the rest of the project. I brought um, some, I have some toothbrushes. All right, that's great. <laughs> and some of the things that we came up with showed up like in the store the, the next year, or a couple years um, later. And so that was really instructive for me in terms of working one-to-one, -one, working with real materials, um, and you know, sort of get out of your head and into your hands kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing is, um, uh, this is going to be a bit of a long introduction. Jeff was really one of the first um, students to um, take Pratt's uh, 3D pedagogy um, into this, I don't know if you're going to talk about this, renowned Saturday class, um, and to make that a big part of his life and his practice, um, and has passed that along in some of his teaching at Pratt. But I actually got it at work in your studio for six years, um, through osmosis, and so that was another kind of gift. Um, and I think the other thing that's very, very mentionable um, is that uh, Jeff was really the first person that I saw in a design business meeting. 
um, repeatedly. I had an incredible luck and fortune to be in um, several of the client meetings, and I could watch Jeff um, work. Um, and it was such a huge part of the business. Uh, cannot be underestimated, maybe even more so now, where a lot of people can actually do the work, but how somebody conducts themselves from a business perspective and a client relations perspective was really a marvel to watch up close. Um, and I think informs like everything that I do, every meeting that I'm in. Um, and then the last thing I will say is, in those meetings, the, the notion of honor was like the loudest thing in the room. It was just so clear that any client that Jeff was in the room with was honored and that the work was being honored, that everything was talked up to. There was like very little ego. There was confidence, but there was no ego. Um, there was respect for the client where I think there's a lot of cynicism around clients. The clients like no more than I think designers give them credit for. And Jeff and Kazuna's ability to draw out the knowledge that the client had about their own business as a way to figure out what the real problem was, because a lot of clients come to you with something and maybe the thing that they come to you is not the thing that actually needs to be solved. And to watch Jeff in action for six years was just like a clinic. It was a master class for me. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just so, so grateful for you. So yeah. I've taken a lot of time here. Um, so please welcome, finally, Jeff Capek. And his wife, Susan. Oh, Susan's here. <laughs> She's crashing. She's crashing. Susan can be a. You can interview her later. She uh, had knee surgery on Monday, and there she is. But she came here not to see me. We're going to see the opera later today. So we, we figured, hey, we just run from uptown, downtown to uptown. That's it. OK. So my talk today will, I'm just going to show you, I'm going to show you a lot of different projects and ideas. I want you to understand that what I'm showing is my experience of design. There are many different ways design can be practiced. There are many different types of design. There are many different objectives. So I'm from an old school, you might say, certainly. <clears throat> but I think um, that part of what we do is practical no matter what. It was practical for Leonardo da Vinci. It was practical for Thomas Jefferson as a designer. It was practical for a lot of other people who came through the ranks. Certainly, it's practical for people like Errol Saarinen, Charles Eames, Ray Eames, people who use their heart, hands, eyes, and feelings, and intellect <clears throat> in a really beautiful kind of combined synthesis. And so um, I think you know, maybe I can pass on a few things that you may find interesting and, um, and uh, we'll see what we go, where we go. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> Other people have worked and practiced design. They, they say and do different things. That's OK. It's all part of a mix of a fabric of, of the designer's world. This is a, well, that's where we live. That's our studio. And that studio was a truck garage. And we had to move. And we had two months to buy the building, convert the building, turn it from a truck garage with f concrete floors and cinder block walls into a really nice studio space, two months. By the way, we're still working. So I was working at the office, and then I'd leave there and work here doing sheetrock work or whatever for till 2 in the morning. So designers are crazy. <laughs> Should get some sleep. So this is just an example of um, just things that we've worked on. I, I need to say that the, our work, and something that I really believe in, um, our work spans from very, very technical, highly, highly controlled, highly confined projects to consumer products. And people ask and clients ask me, why don't you just specialize in medical devices? And I say, because it's really kind of important as a designer to have this broad-based experience because what I'm doing in medical, I may draw from something that I learned in consumer. And what I'm doing in consumer, I might draw something from what I've learned in medical. And to confine yourself, you tend to think along a certain way, and you think in a very, very 
kind of like linear fashion. But when you begin to cross link, like I've done this where uh, we've done something in medical and then I have to do something consumer, I'm saying I'm gonna use a COP plastic because I know the properties of that plastic will be perfect for this consumer product. And the, the person, the material specialist in the consumer's engineering department says, where'd you learn about that material? Ah, from a different world. So I think that's something that you might want to keep. But you know, being a specialist is great, but always on the back line as a designer, you should be a generalist. Just a good, good practice. And, and not only in design, but in life. Go see an opera, <laughs> even though you don't like opera. Some of our space, we also have a full shop. So we're very fortunate because in Connecticut, we can have this big space, relatively big space, not as big as IDEO but big space and we have a shop and we use the shop and the shop is where we think. The shop is where we think. We also have computers. We think there too, but the shop is really important and I'll show why that is so. So just, you know, we've been around for a while and we've had patents, a lot of patents that involve medical devices, medical technology, uh, soft, uh, not software, but GUI, uh, and I'll show you some of that. So. We kind of integrate a lot of different things in our problem-solving process. Um, so there's a left side and right side, and this is important. The left side is what a lot of designers talk about, which is like design strategy, user-centered research, early stage design ideation, human factors, graphic design, interface, product development, industrial design, focus group. The right side is just as important, and that's kind of a thing you're going to have to acquire after you leave school this place and move on to other places. Because knowing how the mechanical engineer thinks, knowing how you make prototypes, knowing how to, what materials are all about, all kinds of materials, how they perform, what they do, that may sound engineering geeky, but it's important. You need to establish a vocabulary so that when, you when you're talking to the engineer, you can use that language and they respect you because you have, you have a dialogue with them <laughs> that they understand. Um, so the other thing of the package design, and, man and this is another one, manufacturing uh, and design for manufacturing is really important. You can't just hand it off because when you hand it off, it gets handed, it gets messed up. You lose, you lose the, the oversight and the un understanding of how a process can be done. Because I've had this experience many, many, many times where an engineer said to me, that can't be done. And I'll come back and say, yes, it can, and I'll show you. Or, yes, it can, we've already done it. Not being arrogant, just being informed. Being informed is really, really important. It's one of the things that you just acquire. I mean, I didn't, I, Pratt had, I went to this series of materials and technology, you know, in my classes. It was great. But after I got out of Pratt and I started doing other things, suddenly all this information started coming in. I started looking at it and absorbing it and absorbing it and talking about it. Talk about it, talk about it. So that it becomes natural for you. So it becomes instinctive. So today's topic is kind of like making meaning, which is a class that I used to teach at Pratt. The first thing, design is all about relationships. Everybody has like all these high-winded flutin ideas about what design is. It's simply about relationships, but many, many different types of relationships. And the designer kind of weaves them together. So that idea of man design for manufacturing and ergonomics, two different disciplines come together. But that's where the challenge is. That's where you really have to work hard. So, engineers are good guys, and they do many good things, but they're basically concerned with physical things of physical things. Think about that. They're concerned about the physical things of the physical things. How do I make this? How do I put this together? What size should it be? What's the, what force curve do I put? What kind of, you know, spring rate do I have? What kind of modulus do I have in the plastic? Da, 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 da. But designers are concerned with the human interface. 
that experience of physical things. That's different. And the reality of abstract things. That's really different. The world is abstract or it's linear. So good design unifies relationships. And unification and unity are really important outcomes of good design. Unity means that everything belongs in that thing, in that object, in that experience. There's no extraneous garbage. There's no decorative stuff. It's like it all makes sense. So that can be even for something like a Louis XIV chair, which is highly decorative. But yet, you know, certain things really make sense when they're put together. So the problem for you, for me, for a lot of us designers, is that this entire set of design relationships, they have to be organized and often very, very complicated. This is not an easy deal. So here are a few considerations that we, we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. End user profile, physical constraints, ergonomics, end user experience, perceptions of end user, size, function, form, the real life usability. And then you get all these other things like environmental conditions. You know, we've designed things and we got them out there and they, they destructed. They just fell apart. We overlooked something. So is the designer responsible for that or is the engineer responsible for that? Or are they both responsible for that? You know, th these are things that you have to start looking at. Regulatory constraints. You get a great design, suddenly the FDA says, no, can't do that. Sorry. Doesn't fit into our, our scheme of things. How do you outthink that? How do you circumvent that? How do you respond to that? If you don't, your design will go someplace that you didn't want it to go to. Life cycle expectations. Sustainability. What kind of materials are we using? You know, in, in, in medical device today, everything's discarded in this country. And everybody said, why can't we do something about that? And that's an interesting problem. I don't have an answer to that yet because when I use a medical device on someone once and I throw that plastic away, I don't have to worry about contamination or something that shows up that suddenly the person's knee has to be taken apart again because there's an infection. All of this stuff, like we go, we think about these, it becomes very complex, like infection control and patient outcomes are driven by design of medical devices that are thrown away. If I don't throw the device away and I reuse it, I have to sterilize it. If I use shoddy sterilization techniques, somebody gets an infection. These are difficult problems. I don't have an answer to them. I'm certainly thinking about them, and I certainly think that technology will bring us there. But again, designers have to think about this kind of stuff. And um, it's not often mentioned in school, but I get hit with it every day. Manufacturing process. Again, I really think it's important that you really, really understand manufacturing process. And that may sound like, oh, I'm never going to go there. I don't, I'm going to be doing experience design. You should know how things are made. You should really know. From the simple things like a, like a, a nail to something like a piano. Because it's all part of a, it makes a more expansive view overall. Having this kind of design experience and knowledge turns you into a better thinker. So even though you may not have the interest in how a camera is made, maybe you should learn. Or certainly when you're involved in any project that you're getting engaged in, run the gamut of what's involved in that product and outside of that product and everything else that comes in contact with the person so that you know why these things are going to behave in a certain way. So, and design thinking, a little comment on that. Design thinking is a great tool, but I'm going to lead this into the presentation. But we invest in design doing. Thinking is great, but you have to do something at the same time. So prototype building helps to design. I really, this is like, if there's nothing else, this is <coughs> the best point I want to make for today. It helps to design and visualize and organize relationships. It also helps you make mistakes, discovery, hit your finger, do things that don't work, get frustrated, and then have delight that an accident that shouldn't have happened turned into a beautiful idea. That's where discovery is. It's not always planned. It's not always intelligent. Sometimes it's just like, oh my god, look at that. 
Ellen knows that. <laughs> so designers being process oriented, not product driven, driven is a unique skill set. It's process. So when we develop product, I want to show you like the ladder of prototypes that we develop. And we do, these are all prototypes we may do on one project. First prototype feels like. I'm in a shop, I'm touching things. This is why I really believe that the shop is the first step rather than somewhere in the between. Because if you go and do it on the computer and then have it rapid prototype, you're suddenly already making commitments. If you go in a shop and start carving things and feeling things and going, ugh, that's terrible, ugh. You, you get, you're getting much more mileage over two hours of your, your, your time spent if you get good with your hands than you do spending four hours on the computer and then waiting for the rapid prototype. I'm not, I'm not, we do use rapid prototyping a lot, but there's a stage in when we bring it in. And this early discovery stage, it's, I don't care if it's sewing, if it's paper, if it's, I have a bunch of Play-Doh in the office. I've been working with it lately for something we're working on to deliver bone curative materials. You know, you just gotta, and that's the thing, you gotta figure out where do you get these materials, what can I use, how can I manipulate it to get a kind of result that I want to learn from? And that's what I think is really important. So the feels like, works like, looks like. Those are all different prototypes. You may have one that feels like and looks like, but what you have for look, works like is completely different. It's a kludgy thing, but that's telling you something else. And then you have should be like and should not be like. And people say, why the hell would you ever make a prototype that should not be something? Why? Maybe I want to show it to a client and go, this is not a good direction. Let me show you why. And the client goes, ah, oh, my, I thought that was the way we should do it. And I said, well, maybe, but try this out. And then they learn and then they, they gain confidence that you have something to offer because you've shown them or you've shown yourself. It should not be this way. Good prototype, really good prototype. And then we go final design one, final design two, final design three, and it just goes on and on until it's like, okay, we've got it now. Let's make it. So I'm going to show you some case studies. Now this is a project we worked on to do early stage diagnosis of pigmented lesions on the skin. Pigmented lesion can be a little dot, and it can look like a freckle, and it can lead to death. Not to scare you, but that, that's phase one melanoma is like the most critical stage to catch. Most dermatologists who are trained in dermoscopy, and only about 50% of them are, and who have been practicing for 20 years are 86% 80, accurate in diagnosis. This device uh, is based on a technology that was originally done for the Star Wars program at Ronald Reagan. And it was based on what we call pattern recognition and pattern categorization. So these scientists, after Reagan left, they all said, we got this, all these algorithms that we've developed that are really smart, what do we do with them? And they started thinking about ideas and came up with this notion of maybe we can detect cancer. So this device takes near-infrared near -infrared light at different wavelengths and it slices through the lesion and then it compares it to a known library of 7,000 cancers. And when it begins to see recognition of patterns that overlap, it says, bingo. This is 98% accurate in, di in diagnosing pigmented lesions in, for, in phase one. So the client said, we got this thing, we have this technology, and we have a, we have a prototype, but it like, doesn't seem to work, fit into the environment. Can you help us package it? And this is the first thing that we do a lot of, which is going out and really understanding users. Like, okay, so who is this user? Who are, and the users are so broad-banded that you begin to go, oh my God. On the left, we have a very, very, very high-end dermatologist here in Manhattan, Midtown. He has a brownstone. He has oil paintings in the brownstone. You, you pay cash with this guy. He doesn't take insurance. One visit to say hi and look at the freckle is $250. Anything more than that is up. So this guy wants a very beautiful environment for his patients. The next slide over um, is NYU Medical Center. 
And it's a, it's a crazy house. There are people screaming, kids yelling, crying, nurses running back and forth, doctors running back and forth. There's no room, everything's cramped. No art on the wall. Next one is a, a dermatologist in Florida. And he's got some problems because his patients, they've got so many marks on their body from being in the sun. Also, by the way, oddly enough, Minneapolis because they're all fair skin, super fair skin, and they go out in the sun and it's bad. So we have all these different environments, and we have to sort of like figure out what is the matrix here? How does this all fit together? What, what do these people want? The guy on the left wants the most elegant thing that looks like a piece of art. The, the people in the hospital, they just want something they can move in and out, back and forth, take in one room, move it quickly to the next room, put it in the corner, get it out of the way, that kind of thing. The person in Florida has got more space because they don't have the constraints that we have here in the city. All different variables. One design? Really? Hmm. So this is what we do. And this is like two weeks worth of work, just to give you a sense of how we work. On the left, we have full-scale mock-ups to kind of understand space, spatial envelopes, where do we work, how do we look, how do we feel, where do we stand. We are like, sketching at the same time we're making these quarter-scale models. <coughs> foam, pink foam, great model material. Cheap, go to Home Depot, buy a big thing of insulation, bring it in, cut it up on a bandsaw. Zzz, zzz, zzz. And in, you know, like I'll go and do a hand, hand piece study for a medical device. And at the end of the day, I'll have 10 studies, 10. And I'm just beginning. And then there are other people doing the same thing. And then we bring them on and we start talking about what do we feel? How does it work? How does it look? Da, da, da. But this process, if you, can, if you can really sharpen your skill sets to do this, really do it well and do it with confidence, even though many design offices will not support this kind of work, and many do not now, what happens if you can go home and do it in your garage and come back with this prototype to go, oh, well, that's interesting. Because when you put something in your hand, when you put something in front of you, when you stand in front of something, when you approach something and you touch it, it's a different experience, and the design that evolves is completely different. Now, we do get involved. We do, by the way, we also do all the engineering. So here we had to package this medical-grade computer, and we wanted to put everything down low. So the design evolved where basically we wanted the pedestal like this, but no, nothing below it until it hits the ground so that it looks small in many environments. And that required a lot of engineering. We had to figure out the structure, the spine, the whole support system, the balance. In medical devices, you have to put a device on a ramp. And if, it's any, if it tips at a certain angle, it's not acceptable in a hospital. So all of these things are working in, in addition. We're prototyping, by the way, prototyping. I've made a bunch of weighted samples to get footprint and make sure I had enough balance and, and, and uh, spread on the wheels. Then the client goes, we love the design. We want to show it at the next show. It's, it's only a month away. Oh, by the way, this is Christmas. Can you get this made up for us? Mm -hmm. Alan knows about this stuff. And crazy deadlines. So here we are, one month later, making a full-scale working prototype. And that's the device. This handpiece here has custom-made Zeiss optics. The computer in this device, this, this, this alone, is $15,000 to make. Don't drop it. <laughs> and so let's talk about design constraints. So the lenses and this here shape, part of this shape, was already defined because of the physics. So we had a real tight design constraint. And we wanted to change it because the, this is not the original. The original that they designed in Germany felt like it belonged in the hand of an auto mechanic. It was terrible. It was sharp edge. I don't, know. They, I don't know what they were thinking of. And we said, we'd like to change this. And the client said, you can't change anything. I said, wait a minute. Can we change the handle? Can't change anything. Why can't I change the handle? Because the PC board's already designed. I said, what if we reconfigure the PC boards to fit a handle that we had in mind? I uh, guess you could do that. Good question. Guess you could do that. What if I not change this, because I understand that this is all reflective, basically the light's being spread out and balanced, but I changed some of this here. I guess you could do that. And so we were able to modify this so this actually fit in someone's hand. 
these questions are questions that you should be asking. And we did, this is the patient card, which was patented. All this stuff was patented, by the way. Wall standing unit for really tight spaces. And then finally, the graphic user interface. So this is the interesting thing. So then the doctors started to say, you know, I have real problems because I have all these patients that come in and some of them look like the Milky Way. There's so many marks on them. I don't know. I don't know where these things are. And we had to design this interface so that it could instruct the doctor that we have a, a, a problematic lesion, but we don't want the patient to know yet. So this user interface evolved, and this is all patented. User graphic user interface was patented because we started to do things in terms of mapping on the body that wasn't ever done before. It allowed the dermatologist to actually keep a record of the patient over a long term so that when he came, or he or she came in two to three to eight years later, you could say the lesion is changing. This is not good. Surgical adhesives. Um, this design got some nice recognition. Klein came to us with a, with a, a, a new material that the FDA was going to allow, and that is an adhesive that can be used in the body that has strong tensile properties but then is absorbed over a period of time. And it's the first time that this type of adhesive was considered by the FDA. It's urethane-based, water-activated, but it also has some very destructive materials that change in, uh, as it's exposed to moisture. So it had to be stored for two years in a material that wouldn't decay or wouldn't be affected or wouldn't provide any extractables into the adhesive. And it had to be dispensed, and it's really thick. It's like molasses. And it had to be spread on the body in a certain way. So we spend a lot of time often in going in surgery when we do these cases. And I'm scrubbed up, but I'm not in the sterile field. I'm sort of in the background recording and watching. But here we see all kinds of behaviors taking place. This is a really interesting environment, by the way, because the professionals that work in that area, the nurses, the scrub techs, all of them are just amazing people. They're just so beautifully trained and so like focused. Um, but it's a good place to observe and to begin to ask questions. At the same time we're doing that, we're beginning to think about how is this device, how are we going to get this material in a way that's going to help the, the tissue planes heal. And here's what happened. The first surgeries for when they do bariatric, people who have really extra, tons of extra fat, they're going to open them up and take out the layers of fat. And it looks like rib roast. I'm serious. This stuff is like, and they're going to then put the tissue planes back together. When you do that, when you ice, when you divide the tissue planes here and then put them back together, because they've been disrupted, you get edema, tons of fluids. So they have to put drains in your body, and then they have to put a corset on you to put the tissue planes together. The concept was we could use an adhesive to bring these tissue planes together, keep them together for a period of time until tissue growth is underway, and then the adhesive will be absorbed. An engineering firm worked on this problem before us. We tried to get this job, and they gave it to an engineering firm. The engineering firm came up with a spray, and it sounded really cool. So you just spray it up, close the body up, everything's fine and dandy for two weeks. What happens is that the adhesive begins to disappear. The spray acts as an interface barrier, so the tissue planes never actually grow together. So what happens two weeks after surgery and the patient's home, suddenly they're beginning to bloat up and feeling terrible pain and possibly infection. So the client came back to us and said, uh, the first one didn't work. And they did this on, by the way, now we're doing this, these studies on animals. And I know this may sound terrible, but this is the only way that, the only model that we can actually see real life pathology or real life uh, biologics. So we said, okay, that didn't work, that makes sense. Put, a, put like a coating on, it's not going to work. So we came up with an idea of tack welding. You see, there's where you get this crazy kind of designer thing, tack welding. Put a tack here, da, 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 da. Bring the tissue planes together, but there's not completely coated so that you have certain zones of the adhesive that bring the planes together, but around them, there's regular tissue. So now the cells can begin, we get fibrin doing this, joining the tissue planes together. And that seemed to work, except that it was really difficult to dispense this material. 
So we had to invent a mechanism, the double pole ratchet, which was patented. So it amplified the amount of force. So like one click would give us a precise volume of dosing. And then we built all these prototypes to test it out. So this is what happens. You see the dots? <clears throat> these are the planes. The tissue planes are being brought back. The dots are put on to the abdominal wall. We bring the tissues back. And, they, and within five hours, they're beginning to knit together. That's industrial design. But on a very, very technical level. I mean, the FDA went through this, this after we finished our work. There were clinical studies in Germany, clinical studies in South America, clinical studies in the United States. This is a, <clears throat> something we did for biologic for spinal surgery. And what we did was they had a, materials that they bring together. When you have surgery in the spine, they want to make the spine fuse together after they do this, the actual mechanical fusion. And you want to get bone to join. But in order to do that, you've got to sort of get the body accelerated to join. So what they're doing now with some of these new biologics, they're taking human tissue, like your own tissue, bone, and your blood, plasma, and they spin it down, and they turn it into a matrix that they can put into like a gel log. But what they had done, it take, took a half an hour in surgery. We had to reduce it down to five minutes. So the design challenge was make this very complicated task, like really intuitive and simple. So we go into surgery again. And this is Dr. Rothman, very, very famous surgeon. And he was just an amazing guy to watch. Technically, these, I just am overwhelmed by just this beauty, beautiful technique that they, that they acquire. So we started working on ideas. Now, here's what the interesting thing is. Look at, these are all done in our shop. And we're thinking, we're thinking about the design process. What are we doing here? Well, they have to take bone chips throughout the course of the surgery, and they used to put them in a stainless steel bowl. Then they take your blood, and they spin it down so you get just the platelets, and they add it with the thrombin, and then they start mixing it together. I mean, you've got all of these different things going together. We began to realize we could consolidate them. We could make the collection of bone coincide with the, with the blood later on. We could bring things together at an early stage so that we're, we're shortchanging everything. But it's like in line of the surgical procedure. And we could only do that by making these stupid models that just, you know, this is long before we had anything in CAD. And then we had this. And this is a base idea that the, the, the forms would sit in that and dock in there and we'd be able to fill it. Now, when I saw these models evolving in the shop, I came back and I said, there's something wrong with some of these. And I want, I'm challenging you. What is wrong with one of them? What is absolutely wrong? It's just difficult to sanitize? No, it's more symbolic. It's symbolic. Use your designer's it looks like color. Huh? It's not white. No? Well, okay. Yes, bingo, bingo. It looks like a looked like a skull. It looked like a skull, and I came in and I said, "We can't put that on the OR. We cannot do that. We cannot do that." These are this is almost like an angel, right? Look at the look at the character. That's part of a designer's. An engineer will not see that because they haven't been, they haven't developed their visual and abstract sense. Again, this top-down, bottom-up, top-down visual thinking. You always have to be on guard. You have to use your eyes at all times. You have to sort of allow that to seep into your subconscious. You have to allow your subconscious to come out and say, I see something. I don't know what it is yet, but I see something. Or I feel something. Or I hear something. That Dr. Rothman, later on we were working on hip instruments. And I said to him, and we were having dinner after, after surgery, and I said, you know, I noticed, and he's holding the, this mallet that he's working for hip surgery. He says, I noticed that you, you're listening. You were listening. He goes, how did you figure that out? I've been telling my residents to do this for years. And so I, I was there. And he was listening when he's tapping the hip implant into the femoral canal to hear the pitch. 
to hear the pitch because surgeons are such tactile visual people. And I picked up on it because we're designers. But these things are really important. You have to really open your eyes. When you see things and you're creating symbols subconsciously, make sure you're aware that you, that those, you know what those symbols are. And that's why prototyping is really great, because you can do this stuff and then say, oh, what did I do? Or you come in that night, it looks good. Next morning, you come in and go, jeez, oh, what did I do? That's not good. So we go through the engineering stuff. And now you see, now we're getting, now these are obviously, now we're beginning to rapid prototype, but we already have kind of like a direction. So we've already made a lot of discovery and mistakes. And this is the technique. So there the bone parcels are put in during surgery. You screw the uh, cartridge in. You put in, this is your spun down blood along with thrombin. Push these two down. It injects it. We develop this manifold system. It fills up this chamber. The log turns into a jelly. And they put that along on either side of the spine. And it accelerates the bone growth. This is for rotator cuff repair. And I'm, I'm going to go through this a little quickly. But this is the interesting thing. So we had to take this scaffold material and rotator cuff, basically, you're putting two trope cars, two ports, and you're going to look one with a camera, and one you're going to be operative. And we have to get that down to this very thin diameter and then into the capsule in the shoulder. And we were working with the top-notch surgeons here in New York and elsewhere, and they were saying, when we were developing these prototypes, they said, oh, I just can't wait to get into this. This is great. This is going to be terrific. We know it's going to work. I love these ideas. So we build all these working prototypes. So then we go into surgery. This is an airline pilot. And how do you get rotator cuff repair? 25 years of flying. He wasn't building buildings. He wasn't making stone walls. He was just doing this for 25 years. Repetitive stress. So he came up with these ideas. The surgeons love them. We go into this $10,000 cadaver lab, and we discover it doesn't fit in because we can't get it into the capsule shoulder. Because why? Because the surgeons didn't understand what the space was. Because they constantly see the anatomy on a screen. And it becomes a complete abstraction for them in terms of size. Can you imagine that? These are like some of the best. And they were, they were saying, sure, that's going to fit in. We got in. We, we discovered uh, none of our prototypes worked. Not one single one. We couldn't get it into the shoulder. So we said, oh, man, look at that. Kept seeing it this way. So we said, let's do an abstraction. And this is the capsule we actually have to work in. That was the reality. So we had to get something coming down through this canal. And when it hit here, it had to sort of unfold, pop open, and lay flat. And actually, this is what we developed. Once we had that, then we had an idea of what we should be doing. It's patented. And what the scaffold does is once you get it in, after you make the rotator, the attachment of tendon to bone, you then put the scaffold down. The scaffold is a ladder to allow tissue to, to begin to grow between, to get the bone and tendon to kind of mix. NICUs, beautiful environments. This is a nurse screaming at the company, that man, a representative of the company that manufactures this incubator. It's a beautiful, the incubator is great. It's a great incubator. But there's something wrong. And nurses are very vocal, kind of passionate people because they have to be, particularly in the NICU, where you have these tiny little infants. And she's screaming at her. We, we, did, we were going through like field trials to learn about what it's like and what they're doing. And she's screaming because there is a problem, and she wants it fixed right away. Because the little infants, you know, it's like really critical environment. I mean, like, look at this. This is a surgeon working on a premature baby. That's a warmer. So they put them in a warmer so that they don't lose body heat. Because when an infant loses body heat, the energy that it needs to build more cell tissue to grow is compromised because it's fighting to generate just enough heat to stay alive. Look at those feet. But this relationship is the thing we should be seeing. Now, Interestingly, the engineers in this company at one point came back and said, we're going to make that shell. Now, this is made out of all acrylic, perfectly clear acrylic with no distortion. But the engineer said, we could make that cheaper 
and more effective would be made out of polycarbonate. And the polycarbonate was made, and polycarbonate has a slight tint to it. The nurses went ballistic. Why? Because this nurse can tell more by just looking at the color of the, of the infant's face and tissues than any diagnostic hookup could tell her. She will see changes, he or she, will see changes long before it shows up on the instrumentation. That's how sensitive they are. And so for them, it's totally visual. Visual touch feel. Totally visual. And here she's showing us how stupid this design is in certain ways. She says, this is what I have to do to get in around the infant sometimes. But these are the things that we pick up. So we go in there and we observe and we record and then we look at it and we begin to make models in the office. So we're beginning to understand what should the shell be like. This is a pro actually a, the first prototype. And the interesting thing about this, what we discover is we can we lift this whole side, create an air curtain so that there's no change in, in temperature, and then have more access without having to reach around the infant or try to get into little portals. And this is a GUI that we had designed that at one viewing can tell you humidity level, air temperature, skin temperature one, skin temperature two, mattress temperature, and oxygen. Previous to this GUI that we developed, there were five different screens. So, again, because the nurses tend to think this way. And that's what we're designing for. Ah. So now we go into something completely different. Again, problem solving. It's all related. All related. So we, we had a job with the uh, Postal Service and magazines. So these engineers are trying to figure out how to sort 1,000, like 1,000 a, a, a minute, sorting magazines, taking them out of one chamber putting them into some kind of thing so all the barcodes are upright and then putting it into the machine. And this is what the engineers are really concerned about is the mechanisms. So they built this prototype and they said, we'd like you to dress it up a little bit. And we looked at this and we said, there's something wrong here. Can you tell me what's wrong with this? Imagine doing this all day long. All you had to do is look at the spine. I took one shot. Now, if I did that all day long, that would be one shot times 250 or 500 times, times how many weeks? You have a, you have a casualty in the works right off the bat. You say, you can't do that. You're twisting, you're doing this back and forth. And the engineer said, but this is the way the conveyors want to be. We said, why? Well, it was easy for them to do on the CAD. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it was more space efficient. So we went back to the office and started creating ideas about how to catch magazines, how to get them to organize, drop into place, and relate to body posture, good and bad, and try to understand how to, how to deal with those problems. In the end, it came out to be something like this so that you would just do this. So you sort here. This is a catch thing. Um, it basically organizes all the magazines. They drop into a certain position. You pick them up, drop them into this hopper. Once it's in that hopper, then it goes completely automated. And uh, you notice that, that the conveyors are not 90 degrees apart. So we had to convince the engineering that this was important enough to reorganize their entire con conveyor design. Postal Service saw it and said, this is something we want because we don't want our postal operators to, uh, to have this problem. Okay, I'm just going to go quick other examples. We did work on the, uh, one of the proposals for the new telephone, public, radio, public phones in New York City. Uh, personal centrifuge for life science design. So this little pretty thing here had a lot of issues in terms of safety. This rotor does, it spins at 10,000 RPM. If you dropped it one day and didn't tell somebody and somebody else picks it up and puts it in the machine, puts in the little things, turns it on, and it ruptures, you kill somebody. So we had to design this not only to, to have a certain appearance and to make it friendly and usable, but we also had to design in a constraint system so that when there's an explosion, 
nothing would leave this chamber, nothing. And they actually had a bunker room with like 24 inch thick walls that they would explode these things in and videotape them. So they would test our things and we actually had to do some redesign and this is all polycarbonate. Handheld photo spectrometer, it's a little $10,000 instrument. Phase change wine chiller for a terraforma to chill wine without diluting. The engineering in this was just unbelievable. This, so much time just to design this little stupid thing, but it works. <laughs> it works. <coughs> Life factory, or maybe you've seen some of these. We did the tops, the cap, the straw, and some architectural work too. This is an interesting piece. This was designed so that this system could be arranged, and these are actually on slides, and you so see the wheels. You can actually group them together, create big, big, big platforms, small platforms. So I'm going to leave you with this. Three levels of knowing. Simplicity. Simplicity on the first level is what a child sees. It's the way a child sees the world. It's right there in your face. But you don't go much below the surface. Simplicity can be really good. And simplicity is something we all have to develop in terms of seeing it. Complexity is what happens when we become an adult. Then we see all the issues. And we say, oh, you can't do that. You have to do this. And there's all these things that are related. And the complexity is part of a problem that we tend to, to solve as adults. But then we forget simplicity. So then it becomes the, the outcome becomes more complicated or maybe becomes convoluted. Informed simplicity is when we can take this and this and find the relationships to join them together. And that's hopefully what you could try to do in your career path as a designer. Thank you. Now, I did bring some objects with me. And I can show you some of these actual things. Some of these you can actually touch. OK, come up. So these are models that we made in our shop by hand, by hand. No, they're, they're, they're machine. We do it by hand. We, here's what we did with that, for example. I got really good at this. <clears throat> you have a profile that you have in mind. You do a drawing of it to start with. Then you paste that drawing on a piece of acrylic, like, like one inch by one inch. Put it in the bandsaw, get a rough profile cut from one degree. Then I tape it back together and I go this way and do the same thing from the top. Then I pull away. So I, you, you got it, I'm gluing the top and bottom on with, with tape double-sided tape so I can do it. Now I have this really rough thing. Then I get a Dremel tool and I use my eyes and I use my sensibility of symmetry and I just carve it. And then when I get, when I get to a point where I feel I have no more machines, then I take the sandpaper out and I start to use my hands. But here's the interesting thing. Like we did, um, we did a, a surgical instrument like this and it was on for a mallet for hip surgery, that doctors. And we went through the first set of early stage conceptual prototypes that we built in our shop with acrylic. And the surgeons felt it and he said, this is great, this is great. So we then tried to translate that into SolidWorks. So we put it into SolidWorks and we got really, we were really careful about translating. We did cross sections, almost like a ship's curve. And then we put it and rapid prototyped it. It didn't feel the same. It was a sixteenth of an inch difference. The yeah. SolidWorks has a rounding process that it does when you're doing like splines and doing surface. And it just deviated ever so slightly as part of its mathematical calculation. We didn't see it. The surgeon felt it. Sixteenth of an inch. It, did, it felt a little shallow right here. He said, I'm not getting the bite that I used to get. What is going on here? And we started to mic it up and go, it's only a sixteenth of an inch. But that shows you how sensitive the sensory world is. Now the surgeon is really sensitive to because their hands are like, you know, golden. 
and they get that, they, they know that feedback, they, they recognize it. Um, so should we, as designers. Um, I'm going to just save these two for later. I wanted to show you these. These, you'll enjoy this. These are surgical instruments that we design for hand surgery. And I should have one more scissors in here. Oh, here, I have them here. So, Typically, these instruments are made with um, forgings. And then after the forging is made, they grind them down, they sharpen them. The problem with this, this device is that this, is a, this, this one not, is not, but one of these can cost $1,200 up to $2,000. And when you're doing hand surgery, you're basically dissecting this for carpal tunnel, for example. You want these blades to stay sharp all the time. But they don't because it's a casting and it's a forging, forging and then it's ground. After sterilization, going back to this concept of sterilization, they begin to get wacky, wonky. So the surgeon may use them for like 10 times and then he goes, she, this is not working. It's not cutting anymore. And I've seen them throw instruments across the room, pissed. Like, ah, give me a sharp instrument. So Klein came up with an interesting technology, and then he said to us, how do we make this? And the technology is one that we're using, rather than something really stiff, we're using spring-based stainless steel, three-quarter hard, which is patented. And it means that the blades are always engaged and they're gliding with each other, they're always in tension. And if they're out, all you have to do is, and you bring them right back together again. So, this particular scissor is made now, rather than going through this whole blanking, it's made from this. This turns into this. Flat bar stock turns into this. And then you can, I will, you know, if you want to try these, you can just to feel it. So the process of doing that, the design here was not only to make it fit the hand properly and make it work, but it was also the manufacturing process. And this is all stages that we went through to try to understand. Look at what's going on with the, with the ring handles here. And you can feel it. Feel the difference between this ring handle and the one you have in your hand. That's wrong. So I mean, it, in the sense that it's not right. So we had to continually re redo the, the ring handle until it felt just right for the surgeon so that they felt that they were in 100% control with that instrument. They love it because it was this new design that we did using the, uh, the stainless steel was lighter and the surgeon said, it feels like it's an extension of my finger, which is exactly what that surgeon wants. Because when you're cutting and dissecting these tissues, you don't want to hit a nerve. You want to know where you are and you want to make sure that when you make a cut, it's really clean. So it's like, it's got to be got to be on target. But we invested a lot of time in this, just going on the shop floor to understand how this was going to be made. And then the work to, to acquire the language and the skill sets to talk to the people in production to say, we need to adjust this. We need to do this. We need to do that. I know you can do this by doing that. So knowing what they were doing and respecting what they were doing helped us to further the process so that they could uh, basically lock it down, get it on target. And uh, these are uh, really well received by the, the surgeons because they stay sharp. They, stay, they cut all the time. I'm going to ask for the... And I, I think you... Oh, this, is, this belongs here. I think all of you can acquire these skill sets. I have two more scissors there. So I noticed that weight is a significant difference, and is that for the responsible <laughs> as they use them? Yeah, yeah. Because here's what happens. So when you have something, you have mass, and if you want to have a delicate, a delicate response, if something is heavy, it can work in your favor or it can work against you. In this case, in this particular case, 
when I cut something that's really, really fine, I want to feel that. If this, there's a lot of mass in this, I'm deadening that sensation that's going into my hand, into my fingertips. So, you know, there are times when mass is good because you want to dampen things, but there are times when you want to bring back more feedback so you want to translate into the, into the, into the hand. And I think that's something, again, as designers, because we're sensitized to these sensory feelings, these are the things that we bring to the table that are different than what an engineer might be sensitive towards. An engineer is going to look at this and say, this weld, if I do it with this, this is a laser weld, by the way. If I do this laser weld and I use this, you won't see it, it's hidden. It's, you know, they'll understand all those, or they'll understand the process. But um, when you start talking about this, like, sensitivity, about how it feels in your fingers, or what's, what radius should I use there, that's a different game. That's a different game. And this is why design has become so important today with product development because we bring this added dimension to the experience of the product. And that's what you have to shoot for. You have to elevate the dimension that you're bringing to the to experience so that there's something better, something good, something satisfactory, or more than satisfactory, satisfying. How many iterations? Well, let me, let me tell you a little question. Let me show you a little thing about that. So we're going to make a first set of prototypes. And they have all this tooling. So I have to find this three-quarter hard stainless steel. Now, this is an interesting lesson that I learned. <clears throat> and um, I go out to this, this supplier. And they said, we have all metals that you want. I said, I need three-quarter hard stainless. And they said, oh, we have it. We, have it in the, we can get it to you right away. So I don't want to buy a lot. I just need to buy enough so we can make 50 prototypes. So they ship it to the manufacturer who's in Montana. And they start making them. And I'm on the floor. And we're going, this looks good, 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 good. We start to use them. And the next thing we know, they're, they're not cutting anymore. They're changing. Well, wait a minute. That's not supposed to happen. The spring steel, three-quarter hard, should keep its shape and shouldn't spring apart. I went back to the guy who sold us the metal. I said, can you give me a spec sheet on that metal? What do you want that for? I said, because this is supposed to have a certain type of alloy, three-quarter hard. Did you do Rockwell testing on this? Well, what do you want to know that for? I said, because we're not, we just spent $10,000 making prototypes and they're not working. Well, we don't give that information out. And what I found out was that they couldn't give a specification, quality specification on the material. And then I went to a shop up in Massachusetts that does, they're the people that make the Rockwell testers. And I said, could you test this material for me and tell me what you think it is? And he goes, oh, that's half hard stainless. Mm -hmm. I said, I see. I said, this is not three-quarter hard? He said, no, no, it's too soft. So then I had to go back to another supplier who cost five times as much, but they did all specifications. They guaranteed the alloy from the time it left the smelter to all of the iterations that it goes through to the time that they sell it to you. Every step along the way, they had a quality control sheet with specifications and testing. And that's the difference, for example, with medical device development. You have to go through that, and you have to get that kind of quali quality control following every material and every process from start to finish, because somebody's life or some, some the, the efficiency of the instrument can be affected. So how do you deal with that in terms of, like, you just wasted $10,000. I had a good client. But <laughs> <laughs> can you ever hold liable someone who's telling you there's something crazy just like none of your work? In this case, it wasn't worth it. We, we had a learning experience. In, the, in, the, in a way, you can say this was a really good learning experience because we learned that when we order materials, we have to be absolutely certain of the, we want the list of all specifications and quality control audits that had done along the line. That's what we learned. Yeah. Can't let it slip. So it was a $10,000 learning, but a good one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the way the client saw it, too. Like, That's good. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, there are times when we just don't know. There are times when you learn by having good, good events and bad events. What I like is that there's a micro texture. Thing. Yes. I wonder if yeah. we did that. it sticks to the latex gloves. There no, no, no. Actually, it's, it's good because it doesn't slip. Yeah, it gives you a little bit. You want a little bit of tactile. You want a little bit of like resistance. 
surface tension yep. to keep that instrument from slipping around. Because remember, and this is what we often do, we'll go in when we test these designs, we're trying to see how they feel in the hand, we'll put a gloved hand on and then we'll stick our hands in glycerin so it's slippery. <laughs> because when you're in surgery, there's fluids all over the place. Blood, slippery. Well, it gets slippery to sticky, depending on how long and the blood begins to, yeah. So th these are, again, these are events that we try to replicate when we're doing design process. We try to figure this out. We try to see this ahead of time, or the client informs us. And then we re try to recreate it. Again, making prototypes and testing and fooling around. Fooling around is a good thing. Fooling around is a really good thing. OK, um, I've got those back. Got this back. Concept here, by the way, was that this thing would get a little bit of spring in the, in the handle. Look at that. Now, you know, and we tested them. We built prototypes and we tested them. Um, Non-sterile sample, not for human use. So for example, so this is on the table like this, and they're, they're working on the patient. And this is open. So the concept is now you're taking the bone particles and you begin to collect. You can do one or two. So as they're going along, rather than translating it and bringing it to another to container, the first thing we did was we began to centralize this. That this could be right alongside on the, on, the, on the mayo stand, and they're just dropping the things in. Your blood was collected long ago. They had to put it through a very specialized centrifuge to get the platelets down, so it's concentrated platelets. And they've got that, and they're going <coughs> to now fill this up with the platelets. And this is thrombin to create the the, uh, the gelling. So after this is all done, and now at the very final stage of surgery, what you do is you put the thrombin in. Notice the color coding. Put the platelets in. And the reason the color coded is that the pathways we had to develop in this manifold have different diameters. Mm. Do this. This pushes this, the blood, the platelets, up into the bone. And now we have this matrix of bone and platelets. It gels, it turns into a log. Take the log, take this off, the log comes out, and then you can either pick it up or we made little things so you can pick the log up, place it on the spine. So I just want to show you some of the, the details that we were attending to. After you put the bone and platelets together, you want to, oh, you want to mix the bone up. I want you to feel it. Now listen, we, did, we worked on this. I mean, there was a lot of iterations just in this. Because if you're spending $1,200 on this piece of equipment and you're going to throw it away, it should feel right. But that idea evolved from those models that we did. We didn't see that ahead of time. We just saw it by making three-dimensional models and playing with the models and beginning to what we call game playing. There's one other thing I want to convey, and I think it's a really important thing, that all designers should become method actors. Think about that. Should become method actors because that's how you immerse yourself in the end user's world. Not by writing, I mean, writing ideas and doing the design thinking is really good, but getting into that experience, going into the, into the NICU and understanding what those nurses were going through and then trying to recreate that and trying to understand that level of sensitivity is really, really an important aspect of the designer's training. Nope, can't do that. Is there a reason for the tint? For the what? The tint on the... Yes, absolutely. That is a, um, that is a polycarbonate. When we, when we uh, sterilize disposables like this, it goes through radiation sterilization, which is gamma. And what happens is it kicks the plastic. It turns color on you. 
But it's interesting, it doesn't turn color until several months later. So it can go from clear to yellow. And it looks very ugly because it looks old and, and, and aged. So when we put this, this uh, violet dye in, it kicks it towards the gray side so that it doesn't look yellow. Everything in medical device has been like challenged and thought through because it has to be. Um, this is maybe irrelevant to what you've been demonstrating, but um, how did you build in a relationship with the clients in the first place? Like, <laughs> no, that's a hard one. I, that's one thing I will comment. Having our own office, the, the, the boutique that Alan talked about, is probably the most difficult thing. Keeping the business going and going through all the logistics of cash flow, client liaison, it's, it's really it's exhausting, I will say that. Um, we build good relationships and we try to keep those relationships. I've had some clients that I've worked with 25 years ago that still come back to us because they know what they're getting. And we try to maintain a really good relationship and if I have to eat something because we're not doing it right, we do it. Um, and I want the client to believe that we do the right thing for them at all times and that we have 100% credibility and that we're not trying to scam them or play games. And when I talk to them, I talk to them straight. And, and they know, they feel our passion. They, more than through words, through work. That's the important thing. I mean, anybody can talk up a story. Look at who's going to become president. But to actually do it through action, repeatedly, over and over again, is what builds kind of a confidence that the client will come back to you. And they'll tell other people about you. And we've been able to sustain ourselves through that method.